Um, so if you wanted to pull up a desktop now, the command to start a desktop in Linux, uh, and back in the day, this is what you always did, you would boot to a terminal and then start the desktop instead of going straight to the desktop. So the command is just start x, S-T-A-R-T-X. So x is the program in Linux that basically controls all the graphics. So this is saying start my graphics environment. As soon as you type that in, it should start to boot you into an actual desktop that you can now use your mouse in, if that's your thing. Um, so this desktop is what we call the uh, XFCE, I think, desktop environment. So it's not GNOME, it's not KDE, it looks a little bit different from what you're probably used to looking at in Linux. It's a really lightweight desktop environment, so it works well on the Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have fancy, you know, transparency effects and all these things that would just take up memory. It's pretty bare bones, but it works like everything else. There's a start menu-like icon in the lower left that you can click to get access to the programs. There's a desktop. There's a lot of tools. Um, the first thing we're going to want to do on this is, well, let me pull mine up now that it's working again. So the first thing we want to do if you're connected is get you connected to the wireless. So if you look on the desktop, I think there's an icon that says something like Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi config or something along those lines. This one here, Wi-Fi config. So if you go ahead and open this up, and there is a way to do this not with, I mean, you can actually set up the wireless from the command line. I can show people how to do that afterwards, but setting it up this way is a little bit quicker and, you know, it gives us a chance to click on things. So the first thing you're going to want to do, this is, you know, not quite as user-friendly as Windows where you just click the network, but if you click the scan button, the first thing we have to do is essentially, and we'll see if mine may not work as well as yours because I'm using a different Wi-Fi, but if you select scan here, uh, eventually it should spit out a list of networks. Mine should be a little slow. Uh, and one of those networks, you should see, like, the CU network up there. Okay, now it's gone. Okay. So you should see this UCB wireless. You'll probably see several copies of it. Pick the one at the top. That's the one that has the strongest signal. Uh, and if you double click on it, it'll bring up a window that looks like this. And you want to click the Add button at the bottom. This is basically adding this to the list of networks that it knows about. Then you can close the scan window. And now on this screen, you should be able to select that network. That's whatever we just added. And now if you click Connect, we'll see if mine works. I haven't actually tested mine yet, but yours should all work. So if you go ahead and click connect, eventually this should change to some information that indicates that it's connected. Um, some people did have a little bit of issue with the Wi-Fi yesterday. It may be because the Wi-Fi signal in this room isn't that strong. It may also be because we're kind of underpowering the Raspberry Pis a little bit. Uh, but if it doesn't work, you can repeat the whole process to try it again. Did you select the authentication? Uh, no, it's an open network. So just add? Yes. Sorry. So under authentication and encryption, it should just say oh, not. Uh, yeah. So you okay. on that after you double click on it on the scan screen, you don't need to change anything. You just click add directly. Um, so once it thinks it's connected, you can actually file up a web browser. That would be that Midori is a lightweight web browser. So you can install things like Firefox on here. It's just not installed by default. Um, but if you open up that Midori, it should load an actual web page. So, oh, yeah. yeah, you want you don't need to change anything on okay. the screen. So just keep it as the yeah, there, there's no Wi-Fi network or there's no uh, the size of my palm. And then get frustrated when I see so even, like, the slightest yeah. lag. And it's funny. I'm going to actually change the screen to something else. So if you open up the web browser and you get, um, so try it again, hit scan again. Uh, if you open up the web browser and you get a web page, you're connected to the internet now. Life's good. Um, if you can't get a web page or the Wi-Fi is just giving you trouble, you can always plug into the Ethernet directly. So there's Ethernet cables plugged into the behind of all the computers you're working on. You plug that in. The Ethernet's a lot simpler than Wi-Fi. When you plug it in, it should just work um, versus the Wi-Fi, which you kind of have to go through this config kind of for. So at this point, you more or less have an Internet accessible uh, little tiny computer. You could start the updates now. Um, that's what you would normally do. Again, don't worry about it because it's just going to take too long for our purposes. Um, what we will do right now is we're going to practice remotely connecting to the Raspberry Pi. So if you don't have an internet connection yet, 
This is going to be a lot easier for people to make the Wi-Fi work. If you're relying on the Ethernet, this actually is a little bit more complicated just because of the way the networks work in here. But um, if you're connected to the Wi-Fi network, we can now go ahead and show you how to SSH into your device. So connect your device without using the keyboard on it directly. So we want to go ahead and open up a terminal. So this LX terminal icon here. Yeah, I know, I know, exactly what you're talking about. Genius. Yeah. I have no idea how to make my text bigger on this terminal, so I hope you guys can read this. Um, so before we can connect to your device, we need to find what's called its IP address. This is its address on the network. So the command to do that on Linux is ifconfig. Your output will look different than my output. WLAN 0 is the wireless. Uh, ETH 0 is the wired connection. LO is just a local connection, so don't worry about that. Um, so if you're connected to the wireless successfully, WLAN 0 should have an address, uh, should have something that says IP address here. It should be like one, someone who has one read it to me. 172.21.64. Cool. That's, yeah, so it'll be of this form. Yeah. So everything on the wireless is 172.21 in this part of the building. So you're looking for an address that does 171.21 dot something dot something. If you're on a wired connection, you won't be looking at WLAN 0, you'll be looking at ETH 0, and it'll be 172.23, I think. Oh, we're on wired, actually. We're, we're dot two oh, one. okay. So wireless is dot two three, wired is dot two one. Um, so just FYI, this next step, I'm going to kind of assume you're on the wireless. It gets a little bit more complicated. So we can now connect to your device, but the caveat is you can't. There, there's the way the CU network works. You can't connect between these two different networks. So if you're on the wireless and your laptop's on the wireless, you can connect from your laptop to the Raspberry Pi. But if you're on the wired, the only way you can connect to it is by like also connecting your laptop to the wired network. If your laptop's on the wired and your Raspberry Pi is on the wireless, you can't connect them and vice versa. So this is where being on the wireless makes things a little bit easier. So for those of you that have a laptop, um, I never got a connection or I could even connect from one Raspberry Pi to another. But for those of you that have a laptop, the next step is you would open up your laptop and if you're using Windows, you're going to need an SSH client. So this would be something like PuTTY is the most common one. So if you Google PuTTY, you can download it. It's a small little program. If you're using OS X or Linux, SSH is built in. So you would open up a terminal. Uh, you want to open up a terminal on your laptop. So if you open up a terminal on your laptop, and if you do the command SSH, and the way the SSH command works is it's user Username at uh, address. Sorry, all my pins are dead. So the username is going to be pi. So that's all your usernames. And then it's going to be at, and then this will be your IP address. So whatever your Raspberry Pi just spit out, 171.23 dot whatever dot whatever. And if you hit enter, once you do that, it should ask you, it probably asks you, like, it's going to give you a warning message saying, are you sure you want to connect? probably just want to select yes. Oh, so this is not a command you would actually run on the Raspberry Pi. This is like to run on your laptop at this point, if anyone's following along with that. Yeah, I tried SSH somewhere yeah. else. So, right. <laughs> you could actually, and if you're working someone, if you can SSH from one Raspberry Pi into another Raspberry Pi. So if your partner and you are both on the Wi-Fi or both on the wired, you guys can connect to across the each other. So, but yeah, if you had a laptop right now, or if you have a laptop that was on the wireless, you can now connect to your device uh, in this manner. <laughs> it's my language setting doing that. It should also, so, I clicked my little start menu. Not, if you want to rely on SSH, like if you're going to start booting your Raspberry Pi not connected to a screen, you would want to set up what's called a static IP address. Right now, your IP address is going to change every time you reboot the Raspberry Pi, which makes it kind of hard for you to reliably connect to it, because you always need to know what the IP address is. Um, so we can, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but if setting up a Raspberry Pi for like always be able to SSH into is something that you're interested in, I can take you through setting up a static IP, so on and so forth. 
The other caveat with this is, if you're doing something like this at your house and you're connected to your home Wi-Fi, the IP address you get is not publicly routable. It's not available on the public internet. And that's actually true of these as well. So when you're at home or when you're on these, you'll be able to connect to your Raspberry Pi from like another computer at your house, but you wouldn't be able to like go to Starbucks and connect to the Raspberry Pi at your house. Um, there are ways to make it so the Raspberry Pi sitting in your house can be connected to from the public internet, so from Starbucks or from wherever you happen to be. Uh, it requires setting up some port forwarding and some other network magic. Again, there's good manuals out there for it. I can point people to them or I can take people through them. So the main takeaway from this should be you can set up SSH on the Raspberry Pi. It provides a good way to work on the Raspberry Pi without actually having to connect it to a monitor, so on and so forth. If you want to connect it to a monitor, that's fine. Um, but a lot of people that use Raspberry Pis are doing stuff like this. Questions on SSH? Is okay. there any way we can connect it even before connecting to the monitor for the first time? Yes, you would. You could set up so when you format the SD card, you can set up like a static IP and SSH right then, so you never have to connect to the monitor at all. So the first time you power it up, you know where it is on the network and you connect to it directly. But I, I mean, I, that falls under advanced setup. Uh, I was going to ask, is an alternative to setting static IP, setting up uh, dynamic DNS? Yes. Okay. That's an option as well. Again, it gets a little bit complicated because you have multiple IPs, right? If you're on the public, if you're doing this at your house, you probably have your public IP and then you have the IP on your internal network. So, but yeah, it's possible. Um, so, I'm going to show you guys two more commands that are fairly useful. So, or three more commands that are fairly useful. So, like I said, that configuration we did at the beginning, you can actually do that at any time. The command to open back up the config menu if you want to change something is raspi-config. You need to run it as root, so you would always start it with sudo. That just means this is a privileged program and it needs to make some low-level changes and I want to allow it to do that. And then you would type in raspi-config. And that will pop back up this screen. So this is the screen you saw the first time you booted. Um, so if you ever want to get back to this screen to change something, the command is just raspi-config. Otherwise, I mean, this is, a, like I said, it's Linux. So any command that will work on Linux will work here. In particular, it's Debian Linux. So if you wanted to go and actually do the updates manually, so one way you can do the updates is use that config menu. But that config menu is actually just going to run the update command. The update command on Debian systems is apt-git. This is also the command you would use to install new software. So if you're like an Emacs user, Emacs isn't installed on here by default. You'd use apt-git to install it. So, but if we wanted to update, we'd run two commands. So we'd do sudo apt-git update and hit enter. Uh, so if you type it, not wrong. And that's going to start the package update. Um, it's kind of a misnomer. When you run apt-get update, it doesn't actually upgrade any of the software on your system. It just figures out what the newest software available is. So it like goes ask the internet, what's the latest version of all of my programs? If you then want to actually update to the latest version, you run a second command called upgrade, which you can do here in a second. That's the one that takes a little bit of time. Um, if you wanted to install something, the command is, so all these commands start with apt-get. So if you wanted to install, the command is apt-git and then just the word install. Sorry about these commands. Followed by the name of whatever you want to install. So this would be Emacs, this would be Firefox. So if you want to load Firefox on here, you would do apt-git install Firefox. Um, one of the benefits of using a Raspberry Pi with Linux is there's a huge ecosystem of software out there that you can already use, right? So if you want Python, Python's installed by default, but you know if you have other programming languages you want, so on and so forth. Um, Python is installed by default, so you know if you're a Python programmer, you could basically start a Python script right now. Um, this is a bash terminal, I think, so if you're into bash scripting. The C compiler and all that's installed by default, so if you want to start, I mean, you can compile stuff in C. This is going to be, we're going to go over the programming stuff more next week, so I'm not going to touch on it too much tonight. Um, but anything you can normally do at the terminal, you can pretty much do here. Questions? So the last command that you'll all want to know is how to properly shut down your Raspberry Pi. I know it's tempting just to yank out the power, and yes, that's probably not going to break anything, because a lot of smart people 
know that their users are stupid and to put in a lot of effort to try to make it so you don't break it when you do that. <laughs> but you shouldn't rely on the fact that good people have put in a lot of time to allow you to do that. You should do it properly. Uh, and the command to do it properly is just shut down. Again, this is a privileged command, so we need to start with sudo. Uh, and the command would be shut down. Now, shut down has a number of flags after it, depending on what you want to do. You can also use the shutdown command to reboot. So if you wanted to reboot, the flag is dash R. If you want to actually shut down, the command is dash H. This stands for halt. So what that means is take the machine down and basically stop the processor. You've probably noticed the Raspberry Pi has no power switch. So even when you after you, once you do shutdown dash H, when it's done, basically it'll turn off the screen. When the screen turns off, you can then go ahead and unplug it and that'll turn off the LEDs and stuff. You then need to give it a time parameter. So if you want to do it right away, you just say now. So sudo shutdown dash H now would go ahead and start the shutdown process. And when it gets down here, so when my screen turns off, then it's safe to go ahead and unplug my Raspberry Pi. If I wanted to start the Raspberry Pi again, I would have to unplug it, plug it back in, and it'll start the boot process up again. Um, but there is no on-off switch. When it's plugged in, it's basically on. When it's unplugged, it's basically off. But you do want to halt the operating system before you unplug it, because that ensures that you don't unplug it in the middle of the disk write or something that could screw things up. Questions on shutting it down? OK, so we have about 10 minutes left. I will just leave this time for you guys to poke around at stuff, and I'll walk around and ask, answer questions as they pop up. Um, next week, we'll be back here again, same time, same place, and we're going to be going over some of the programming on the Raspberry Pi. There's nothing inherently magic about programming on the Raspberry Pi. It's just programming in Linux. Uh, we are going to try to focus on using some of these Raspberry Pi specific things, because that's what makes it programming on the Raspberry Pi versus just programming anywhere else. But because it is Linux, programs that you guys have written on your laptop in Linux should probably run fine on the Raspberry Pi. So you can develop on another machine, bring it to the Raspberry Pi, compile it there, and you're good to go. So we're going to be going over programming more next week. I'll stick around. Well, I'll stick around as long as you guys want to. but. Stick around, feel free to play for a little bit, and I will answer questions <laughs> in the next 10 minutes as people have. It's just to know it works.